Okay, today we are going to talk about atoms, how they're made, and what we can figure out about each different type from the periodic table. And I'm going to abbreviate periodic table of the elements like that. What? PTLE? Periodic table of the elements. Oh, uh. I don't know why there's not another T in there, but there isn't. That's weird. Um, so, first thing is, of course, that, so it's, here's the review part. Um, you know that there are three particles that make up every atom. Combination of the three. What are those particles? Electrons. Electrons. Neutrons. Neutrons. Protons. protons. Let's let's start with protons for no real reason, but uh, what charge is on a proton? Positive charge. If we looked into atoms, where would we find the protons? In the nucleus, in the center part. Yep. One thing that you may not have come across before is we will also be looking at masses of these things. Since they are so small, I mean almost inconceivably small, we don't use grams or kilograms. We can, we can find their mass in grams and kilograms, but they're such tiny, tiny numbers that we don't often use it. Instead, we use new, a new unit, um, and mass of a proton is very close to, so this means approximately, one AMU, atomic mass unit. Just a new unit that's really, really convenient to use when we're talking about atoms, because so many of them are protons. Now the protons also play an important role in how we categorize atoms and elements. This is the value, this number <coughs> of protons tells us what kind of atom we have. And say that they define the kind of atom. Something with six protons is always a carbon atom. Anything with a number other than six is never a carbon atom. It's always some other type. So this, in a way, is the most important thing to know about an atom. We have neutrons. What kind of charge would you expect on a neutron? Maybe neutral. Maybe neutral. Where would we find them in an atom? Also in the nucleus. So the nucleus is the protons and neutrons that make it up. Its mass is very similar to a proton. So again, it's approximately one AMU. They are just slightly different, but for our purposes, they're close enough to be the same, and they're close enough to one. And they, their only real purpose, they give things mass, that's not really a purpose in itself. The only real purpose, though, is to hold an atom together. Because let's picture these protons extremely close together. Well, if they're all positive, what do they do to one another? They repel. Well, how are you going to get all of these protons stuck together if they're always repelling? <coughs> What's that? Add some negatives in there. You could add some negatives, but we don't. 
Nature doesn't. These are neutral, in fact. Instead, um, they repel because of one force called the electromagnetic force. We've talked about electro, electricity and static. So that's when they're, what's repelling, but when things get very, very close together, there's another force called, which we call the strong nuclear force that holds them together. And protons and neutrons attract each other <coughs> with this force. It's not strong enough if we only had protons to keep them together, but once we mix in some neutrons, then that force is strong enough to overcome the protons pushing <coughs> each other apart. Okay, and then the third type we have, the electrons. What charge is on an electron? Negative. Negative. Same amount of charge as a proton, but the opposite side. Sign. Where would we find them? Oh, well, I, I had. Uh, we'll get to you in a second. We can't first. Outside, So not really a, a surface like a planet has a surface. And outside is maybe a little vague. They're way outside. So as an example, if we picture this tennis ball as the nucleus where all of the protons and neutrons are, the outside where the electrons are would be about the size of Stewartville. That was, a, that was an appropriate gasp. So if this were the nucleus, let's say carbon. Carbon usually has six protons and six neutrons. They're stuffed in here. The electrons orbiting that would be a, in a cloud that's about the size of Stewartville. Wow. But not so small compared to the tennis ball. Um, most of that space is empty, in fact. And not air, because air is made up of atoms nothing nothing at all almost all of the mass is here but all of the space is taken up by that cloud and so if you were if you could look at yourselves we saw the electron microscope ver vision of what the uh, or what the bronze of the bell looked like you could see the little pinpoints that's where the nuclei were but then the rest of that space around them is completely empty there are electrons moving around very, very fast, but they don't take up very much space. So these are in a cloud <coughs> orbiting, I usually say, the nucleus. But it's really, really big compared to the nucleus. Also importantly, these are arranged in shells. Atoms, as it turns out, like onions or ogres, have layers. And so they're, they're arranged in these shells. So if they're arranged in shells, filling inside to out. So if you find a, an atom that has two electrons on its outer shell, all of the inner shells are already full. Okay, now, where this relates to the periodic table. The periodic table is arranged to tell us a lot about the individual atoms listed in it. I'm going to put my favorite up here, an example of it, let's move it over. My favorite is ruthenium. It's number 44, so at this point grab your periodic tables, have those out. If someone doesn't have one, I've got a few extra copies here and I can, I can run off more if you need. The tile looks like that. You can share for a moment. Ruthenium, by the way, is my favorite because Rue happens to be, and we didn't do this on purpose, but Rue happens to be my daughter's middle name. So, kind of fun. 
Rue. R U E. No, R U. That is an appropriate spelling. Um, R O U X is also. That's, that's French. It's a French sort of uh, sauce, almost a gravy. Um, Rue can also mean street in French. R U E. But this is none of those. Are you? It's short for Rupert. Rupert. My wife, when we were picking child names, I kept saying Rupert, and it was mostly a joke. But I said, I, no, let's name him, if we have a boy, we'll name him Rupert, and uh, we can call him Rue for short. Are you? And she didn't like that idea, and she thought I was serious, so she came up with a compromise that if it were a girl, we had already picked the name Ivy for her first name, her middle name could be Rue. And we had it before Beyonce named her daughter Blue Ivy. Oh, yeah, you told us that. Yeah. It's a good name. Okay, 44 here. This number is called the atomic number. You'll see that on the top. There's a little key there. Yep, there's a little key on the top of your periodic table. Um, these, by the way, you can write on the copy that you have here when it comes to quiz time, the first of which is on Monday. You will get a fresh copy, gentlemen. You will have a fresh copy without any writing on that you can use. Um, but these are fine to write on and use it with homework. Atomic number there, that tells us the most important part, and you'll notice that it's arranged in increasing number. This is the number of protons. <coughs> So you see, it starts with hydrogen. Anything with one proton is hydrogen atom, always. Two is always helium. In a neutral atom, which we're going to be talking about first, it's also the number of electrons. I'll just specify in a neutral atom. So if an atom is neutral, it has the same number of protons as electrons because that's what balances the charges and makes it neutral. We also have some abbreviations that I write a fair number of times. Uh, proton is P plus, electron is E minus. So we'll, I'll just use a shorthand from here on out. We've also got on each tile um, the chemists sometimes call this a different word, but it's the atomic mass is the best description. Chemists don't always acknowledge the difference between mass and weight, so they often call it atomic weight, but what is the difference? What is weight? It's the force of gravity on something. Mass is an inherent property. It's just how many pro essentially how many protons and neutrons there are in something and weight is then the force of gravity. But in practical terms, it probably doesn't matter. This is the average number of protons and neutrons in a sample of an element. Neutrons are abbreviated N with a zero. But you'll notice it's a little weird. We had protons which had a mass of one and neutrons which have a mass of one. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Let's just do the example. And then we'll get to that. So in this example of ruthenium, it has 44 protons. Plus, let's make that plus, plus some number of neutrons. Those are the things with mass in the nucleus. The electrons don't add it significantly to it. And they add up to the atomic mass, 101.07. So that means how many neutrons should ruthenium have? Uh, 
I just asked you to move on. Yep. Toby, 28.53. No. How did you get that? I did 101.07 minus 44 divided by 2. Why did you divide it by 2? Well, oh wait, no, I didn't see that. Okay, so I thought it was 44. That's a question mark, sorry. Sorry, yeah, question mark. I'll, I'll just take that away. Oh, okay. Sorry. So no, no divided by 2, which gives us how many? We solved them. So 44 protons plus some number of neutrons is equal to 101.7. That's what atomic mass gives us, the average number of protons and neutrons in a sample. So that means that we must have 57.07 neutrons. Here's the problem though. There's no such thing as a fraction of a neutron. You can't cut them. You sort of can, but you don't get more or you don't get a smaller neutron from it. You get a couple different particles that are no longer neutrons. Um, so what gives? I, I will give you a hint that I'm not wrong on any of this stuff. So this is right, but that doesn't work out. If each proton and each neutron have a mass of one, when you add a bunch of them together, you have to get a whole number, but this isn't a whole number, and you'll notice a lot of the other ones on the periodic table are also not whole numbers. They're, all, they're almost all decimal numbers. So what gives? How could this possibly be? So the electrons come in? Not quite. That's not a bad idea, but electrons are only about one one thousandth of the mass, so they'd be out you know, you'd have another number and another number, and they'd be out here somewhere. So that doesn't contribute significantly. There are, a, yeah, and that's why I'm saying most of the metals have decimal numbers in there. Most of the atoms have decimal numbers. But they all have whole numbers of protons and neutrons. No atom can have a partial proton or a neutron. Here is the key. Average. If we got a whole bunch of ruthenium, it would have a mass of 101.07 atomic mass units on average. But that's because a lot of them have 57 neutrons. Some of them would have 58. And there may be other numbers too. This number is the average, it's a weighted average, so that if we round this number to 101, we're going to get the, num the most common number. We call these isotopes. Isotope is a combination of two words that you are familiar with, Greek, or at least the iso you've seen before as a prefix in other words, especially in, well, what, it, what is that, what, what were you doing there, just to be on camera? No. <laughs> no, you, you, but you cut the word off, right? Yeah. What's the whole word? One. Okay. Isolation. Isolation, yeah. Thank you. Isolation is one place where we use this. That's not as easy to figure out the meaning of it, though. You also use it in math. Where do you use the prefix iso in math? Oh, isosceles. Uh, isosceles, but a triangle, not one side, or what? What is an isosceles triangle? A triangle. Not necessarily a skinny triangle. No. It's, it's, um, two sides are the same. Oh, I was going to say it cute. No, it could be almost any angles, as far as I know. But two sides are the same. Iso means same. When you isolate something. You take the same things and move them aside. So often we call that we isolate a single person. So that and that's what the basketball play is, right? But yeah. and when we isolate people or isolate an animal or something, we're taking that one animal. But it really means get all the same things to the side. Tope is means type. 
So these isotopes are same types of atoms. These are atoms with the same number of protons that means that they're the same element but differing numbers of neutrons So that's our ruthenium with a lot of them have 57, probably about 92, 93%. Some of them have 58, probably about 7%. So that when we get a whole bunch of them together, they average in between at 101.07. That just tells us where the uh, most likely isotopes are and the approximate balance of them in a natural selection of grouping of them. Um, you'll notice that on a lot of other ones. Look at hydrogen. Hydrogen's number, atomic number, is one. That means it's got one proton. Its atomic mass is 1.008. That means most hydrogen has zero neutrons. Because when you add one, one proton plus zero neutrons, you get close to that 1.008. But a small fraction of them have more. There's something called deuterium, which is uh, hydrogen with a mass of two. We just gave it a special name. Um, it has one proton, one neutron. There's tritium, hydrogen with a mass of three, one proton, and two neutrons, and those occur naturally. But most of it's hydrogen with just the proton, which is why it's such a so close to the number one. We use some of the other ones, especially the deuterium, in um, nuclear reactors. Okay, so that's the two main numbers on there. There are also some other important numbers around. You'll notice the uh, periodic table in the back actually has these rows numbered, which you should do now. One for the top, first row by hydrogen, two for lithium, three for sodium, and keep going. Don't worry about these last two. I'll talk about those in a second. So just not number one through seven going down, seven next to francium. Those have to do with the electrons. I said electrons are arranged in layers or shells. Shells around a nuclear around the nucleus. The row number, that's the on the side. That tells how many electron shells an atom in that row has. Right, so as they keep getting more and more, they fill up one shell, then the next electrons go into the next outer shell until it's full, and then they start filling up the next and so on until there are no more electrons. And then across the top, it's numbered one through 18, or one through 12, and then three through eight. Um, those are the number of electrons in that outer shell, which we call a valent shell. So I'm going to say that's column number. Remember that columns hold things up. So that's why they're at the top. They refer to the vertical part. So they tell how many electrons are in the outer shell. And we have a special name for that outer shell called the valence shell. And so when we're talking about valence, that's what we mean, the outer shell. These are important 
because these are responsible for chemistry. <coughs> Chemistry is how atoms interact with one another. And it's always using those outer shells. The rest of them never come into any kind of close contact. So it's sort of like two towns that are growing and they touch only at the edge. And the nucleus in the very center of the town, they never really come that close. Nuclei don't hit each other. But the outer shells could and they might even stick together for some reasons that we'll learn a little bit later. scroll back down here in a minute for anyone who's not done, but let's go back to our example of ruthenium up here. Ruthenium is under the 8, and then if you go over to the side, the row number is 5. So, how many shells of electrons does ruthenium have? Yes. Five. This number tells us, and everything in that row has five shells, so it's working on filling its fifth shell. How many does ruthenium have in its outermost shell? That's the number up top. So what we see, and you, you probably have noticed that, okay, it goes one, two, and then three through 12, but then it starts back at three and goes to eight. Very often you'll see these numbers as 13 through 18, doesn't really matter for our purposes we're going to be doing chemistry so which is how they're going to join together just with the first two columns and the last five which is why I've got the numbers set this way we don't deal with these too much these are arranged be and the periodic table is arranged because there are several different subshells so it's different groupings of electrons that kind of go together the first subshell is the it's called the s it's two, it can only hold two electrons. That's these first two columns. Or if you notice, there are only two um, elements in the first row. That's because that very first shell only has that S and it fills up with two electrons. So hydrogen gets one, helium gets a second, gets a second, so that's full. All of these over on the right hand side are full shells. So once you get lithium that has three electrons, well, it fills up the first shell and it starts working on the second. Then you go lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, all the way over to neon, which has now filled up its shell, so that when you get to sodium that has an additional electron, those 10 plus one more, it's starting on its third shell. And that's why we organize it this way. This block in here is a different subshell that can hold up to 10. Over here is a subshell that can hold up to eight. These down here, they're broken out because they're the only uh, atoms with that fourth subshell that can hold here. And it's just easy to slide them out. They would go, so this top row with cerium would go right after lanthanum up there where the arrow points. And uh, th thorium would go right after actinium. But then we'd have to move this whole part of the table over to make room for it and it'd make it super wide. So we just take those two out. We could do the same thing with this center block and remove it. It's just not convenient to do so. So these do fit right up in there. We're gonna be practicing it for this first proficiency is all of these different things. So let's pick one and do it together. Let's find, let's find calcium. Right over on the left. Got it. First question is, what is calcium's atomic number? Sure. 20. 20. Yep. And that one will always be given, sort of given because it's in the key. What does that tell us about calcium? Or, or I should say, let's come back to that. Um, what is it calcium's atomic mass? 
40.08. Also no and it's oh eight, yes. Good advice, Drew. How many protons does an atom of calcium have? What? How many protons does an atom of calcium have? And yes, let's please see hands. Yeah, Evan. Twenty. Same as the number. How many how many neutrons would a normal or a mo the most common atom of calcium have? Yep, Courtney? Courtney? How do you know? Because protons and neutrons are all related. They're not the same. Oh, no. Yep. Uh, Link? 40.08, that's the average of the number. That's the average of what, though? Of uh, number of neutrons and protons in the same. Neutrons and protons. Yeah. And I asked just about neutrons. So if you add them up and you get 40.08 and you know that you have 20 protons, how many neutrons must you have? What's that? 20. We have to round the number. The 40.08 goes down to 40 because we're taking the most common. But then we subtract them. So you weren't wrong, just not for the correct reason. Um, this one happens to have the same number of protons as neutrons. It doesn't happen a ton. How many electrons would a neutral atom of calcium have? Yep. How do you know? Well, the atomic number gets the number of electrons. Bingo. Neutron, yep. So that's the same as the first 20 in here, the same as the number of protons. How many electron shells does calcium have? Mm -hmm. Two. How do you know? But a column, a row, tells us how many shells. Oh, four. four. It's in row four. Columns are the things that hold, hold up buildings, so they're up and down. So, though, then how many electrons are in its outer shell? Yep. Oh, two. That's the number on the top. Those two, those two values are the easiest to get turned around and confused on, so make sure to practice. Homework 7.1 is practicing these.